Hey y'all, this is Pastor Chad Richardson, Campus Pastor Celebration Church, Mandeville Covington Campus, asking you to take a moment and press the share button right now as we begin our Wednesday night teaching on the series called Love. We'll be looking at a love that forgives. I'm asking you to take a moment, go get your Bible if you don't have it, get you a notepad and a pen so you might be able to take some notes, and I'll ask, I'll answer questions just not on this video. You can submit those to the comments or even send me a private message and I'll be glad to answer those questions the best way that I can. If I don't know, I will find out, but you will get an answer for all your questions. So please take a moment and a answer any questions or ask any questions that you have during this time. Uh, we are going to be in Matthew chapter 18 verses 20. 21 through 35. And uh, so if you have your Bibles, if don't go grab it, uh, and I'm going to start us off with a word of prayer and we're going to get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you and love you for being an awesome God. And uh, you are worthy to be praised and we thank you for the opportunity we have to study your word. And I pray that tonight as we look at the subject of forgiveness uh, and, and putting it together with love, that, Father, you would uh, help us understand this teaching. You would help us to understand what it means in our life. And we pray that we would be able to show love to others through the forgiveness that we offer. So help us, Lord, learn, help us to grow, and help us to go and, and be like Christ everywhere that we are. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Again, we are in Matthew 18. As where we're at, we've been looking in this love series as we've looked at God's everlasting love, God's unlimited love, responding to God's love, and then we looked at several ways that that love responds. We, we respond to love that serves, a love that submits, a love that prays. Last week, we looked at a love that comforts, and today, we're looking at a love that forgives. We only have one more week left in this series, and so I pray that you will make plans already to join us next week. And again, you can always go back and find all of these teachings on Facebook or on our YouTube channel and uh, and go back and watch the ones that you've missed so you can catch up. You know, when we think about God's call to marriage, we're surrounded with a lot of love and wisdom when it comes to uh, the way people view that. Even in the Christian community, we have lots of ideas about what marriage looks like. But one of the greatest things I've ever seen or ever heard when it comes to counsel on keeping a marriage relationship exciting and, and vibrant and full of joy uh, was this statement. Do not ever withhold forgiveness from one another. That sounds like a dumb statement, right? Or, or a duh statement. But the reality is how many of us struggle with that in our marriage relationships? But you know, the urgency to forgive each other does not stop at marriage. You name the relationship, forgiveness is a must. And we're going to be looking at that tonight. In this passage, Jesus demands that Christians forgive one another and that there be no limit to, his, to this love that forgives. So let's begin by this, asking this question. How are you affected when you carry a grudge against someone? I can tell you in my own personal life, that there have been many times, unfortunately, that people have wronged me and I allowed that to become a grudge in my life. And here's the problem is, it'd be great if I was able just to kind of forget about it and move on with my life, but any time a name of someone that has caused me wrong comes up or has come up, I can tell you that because of the grudges that I, have not, that I did not uh, forgive, I did not let go, I would get enraged. I mean, I would get angry. My wife could even tell you that uh, she'd ask something or say something. I'd get angry, and she's like, what are you so mad about? And I couldn't even tell you just because I had not let whatever was, was going on in my life, I'd never forgiven that individual. I never let that go. I never let what they do uh, did go by the wayside. And instead, I carried it aside. And all that did was cause more and more anger in me, which causes blood pressure problems. I mean, sometimes my anger would get so out of control that I'd want to hit something. Now, I'm, not, I'm talking about a person. I mean, hitting a wall. I'd want to kick a, kick a fence. I'd want to do something just to get the anger out of me because of that grudge. And the easier thing would have been not to have the grudge at all, right? I mean, to have had forgiveness offered to that individual. And I hate to say that that's happened in my life, but it has happened in my life. And I can't promise that it wouldn't happen in the future, but I can tell you how it affects me. It affects me greatly. Have you thought about have you ever thought about how those grudges you carry around are actually affecting you? That it could be affecting your health? That it could be affecting uh, your attitude, your mental state? It could be affecting uh, your, your ability to have uh, energy or those kind of things? You probably haven't thought about it, but if you'd stop and think about it, you probably could think of a number of things that your uh, life is affected because of those grudges. Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 18. Let's see what Jesus has to say about this whole concept of forgiveness, right? So beginning in verse 21, it said, Then Peter came to him and asked, 
Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Verse 22, no, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors who brought in owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owed, owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, Please be patient with me, and I will pay it all. Then his master filled with pity for him and, uh, and was released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down for him and begged for a little more, uh, begged for a little bit more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put into prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man who had, he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Behind Peter's question was a Jewish teaching that uh, that to forgive somebody, it, it was only a, a, a few times you would forgive them, and that was reasonable. Actually, in Jewish teaching, it was three times, and that was more than enough reasonable to, to forgive somebody. After that, you'd write them off. You'd have nothing else to do with them. Now, doesn't that sound kind of familiar? In our own society, what do we say? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Oftentimes, there are many people that live by the rule that one, two, three strikes, what? You're out. And we're not talking about baseball. We're talking about relationships. We see that even in the law. In many states, in a DWI case, somebody commits a DWI three times, they're put away for good. They don't have any possibility of parole. They practice the three strikes, you're out rule. And unfortunately, many of us have that same mindset. And so it's really interesting that when Peter came in and was asking this concept of seven, um, the first thing that comes to my mind is, who was it that Peter was having unforgiveness toward that he would ask Jesus that question? Because obviously Peter knew that Jesus taught differently than anything, in a lot of ways, than anything he would have ever been brought up as a young Jewish boy learning. And this would be one of them. So Jesus, you know what? I've got somebody I'm upset at. How many times should I really forgive him? Seven times? I mean, of course, we know the number in the Bible, seven, is a, is a per, number of perfection. Um, so it's interesting that he would ask that, that, uh, that there's a perfect number to forgive people and it's seven times. If I've got to do it beyond the perfect number of seven, they just ain't worth my time. But here's the thing. Jesus responded with a whole different thing, right? Uh, he responded with a, with a different number than what Peter had in mind. And so it's interesting that you can imagine this exchange between Jesus and Peter probably was a little tension from Peter's side. Because who is it that he was unforgiving? Was it well? We know it. We know Peter was married because the Bible said he had a mother-in-law. <laughs> Did he have some problems with his mother-in-law? Did he have some problems with his wife? Did he have problems with a former business fishing part or fishing business partner that he had? Who knows? But something was driving this issue that would make Peter ask this kind of question. So obviously, there's a little tension that's going on in Peter's life in doing this. But let me ask you this question: What keeps Christians from forgiving each other? Well, I can tell you. It's a five-letter word. Starts with a P, ends with an E, and the middle letter is I. It's the, it's the word pride. Pride keeps us from, from forgiving each other. Because in order to do that, I've got to be willing to say, yes, you wronged me, but you know what? It's all good. We're going to move forward. That means I've got to be willing to let go of my, I've got to let go of my anger, my hatred. And quite frankly, most of us don't want to do that. We want to hold on to it because by doing that, it gives us a sense of control. And to forgive means we have to relinquish the control in our lives. Now, not content to let the matter rest with forgiving 77 times is what Jesus said. Jesus proceeds to elaborate his statement with a parable. Why did the king in the parable originally forgive the servant's debt? 
Well, we see as we go back in verse 27 that, or verse 26, that the that the uh, slave begged and pleaded. I mean, after all, he was about to be sold, his wife and his children and all of his possessions. Everything that, was, that, 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 that made up this man was about to be sold to try to pay at least a portion of what he owed this king. And he threw himself at the mercy feet of the king, and the king saw that and took pity on him. Um, because... You know, there was obviously, he saw the desperation of this man, and he's willing to say, you know what? I can give this guy, a t I can give this guy a time. But what do we look at the story, and one thing that we learn is that king, the king goes beyond what the servant requested. If we go back in verse 26, the, the, the servant said, please be patient with me. I will pay it all. So what the servant was asking was for more time. God, or King, give me more time and I will be able to pay back what I owe. But what we see out of the king is that the king goes beyond what the servant requested. What we see is the king not only says, don't worry about more time, but I'm going to release you from your bondage and I'm going to forgive all the debt, wiping out. Now, I don't know about you, millions of dollars. I have never seen a million dollars in my lifetime. Matter of fact, I'm not sure if my wife and myself could work the rest of our lives and ever achieve the status of earning a million dollars. I wouldn't have a clue what a million dollars looks like. And I realize some translations say different amounts, but you have to understand that the New Living Translation, when it equates it to the millions, that's actually the correct uh, uh, term to put it in, equivalent it to our money today versus what it was worth back then. It would have been worth millions. And so I don't know what that's like. I can't imagine borrowing that from somebody. And I definitely could tell you I would never give it to anybody at all. I don't have that kind of money. And I definitely wouldn't lend that kind of money out to anybody. That just seems kind of foolish, doesn't it? But the king did. And the king then began to decide he was going to have pity on the guy. He was going to re release him from being in prison and forgive him of his debt. Now, we see the servant leave. And did you notice that the first thing the servant did or didn't do, he, he didn't go to Burger King and go grab a Whopper. He didn't go to Chick-fil-A and get a chicken sandwich. He didn't go home and kiss his wife. He didn't go home and go play ball with his son. The first thing after being released from prison, being forgiven, and his debt being wiped clean, he goes and seeks out a fellow servant. That owed him just a few thousand dollars. Grabs him by the throat. Essentially like he slams him against the wall. The guy asked for more time, just like he asked the king. And instead of giving him more time, he says, guards come take him away and throw him into prison. Now, when you hear that, what comes to mind? What is your first initial reaction when you hear what this servant did? I can tell you personally, I'm just being honest. Just being honest. Please be honest, right, church? This is honesty. I'd want to take a two by four and I'd want to smack it over his head until he couldn't until he couldn't stand up anymore. Why? Because of what just was forgiven of him, and then he's going to go out and do something stupid like that, right? I mean, that's just ridiculous. Why would anybody in their right mind be forgiven of all that? And then all of a sudden want to go out and, and grab somebody to their throat to demand not even a fraction, not even a point one percent of what they owed somebody else. Could you imagine ever seeing that? I'd imagine most of us are probably very enraged by that. It's amazing. But as we think about it, how did that second servant's debt compare to the first servant's debt? Not even in the same ballpark. Matter of fact, not even on the same planet, y'all. It's that different. But you know what? We do the same kind of thing. Believe me. You and I have done the exact same thing. As we think about this parable, let's think about who these characters represent. The king, obviously, is God. The first servant is us. The second servant is anybody and everybody that has ever done us wrong. And you could probably name right now three people just that quick that have done you wrong. You don't have to think about it very hard. But when we think about the concept of what we have done to God compared to what others have done to us, it's not even close. Now, 
I know there's some smart aleck right now that says, but you know what? I've never drank. I've never done drugs. I didn't run around with lots of women or lots of men. I'm married to the only person I've ever uh, ever had sexual relations with. Um, uh, I've never taken anything from anybody. Heck, the worst thing you can say about my line is the little white lies because I've always lived a very honest, upright life. And what we do is, in our minds, we've justified that we live this incredible life. But God says, ha, you're a liar. You've done all of those things just in ways that you never thought about before. And then what we do is we try to justify what we think we've done to God, and we look at what other people have done. We say, well, that person over there, uh, they, they've been arrested for a DWI and went to jail for manslaughter because they killed a family of five. That person over there, they've been sleeping around with everybody that's got legs. This person over here, they treat their dogs horribly. They kick them and beat them and, and, and chain them up outside. This person over here, they couldn't tell the truth if they tried. We try to think about all these people over here that either have ever done us wrong or people we just know about, and we try to compare our lives to others. And here's the problem. God doesn't do that. God doesn't compare our lives to others. God compares our lives to Jesus. And I can promise you this. There ain't none of us could stand on the altar and say that we're even close to being even a fraction of what Jesus is. So guess what? That makes us just as bad as anybody else that we can name right now, including those that have wronged us that we may never have wronged. We do sin all the time. See, here's the problem. What we have to understand is that sin all required the same penalty, death. And God says because of our sin, we are doomed for hell. We've already got our ticket to hell when we're born. We were born in sin. And we have our ticket, one-way ticket to hell, right? And God says that, that but, but I don't want you to go there, but that, that sin's got to be paid for somehow. Either you got to pay for it or somebody else has to pay for it. So God said in his love, he sent his only son, Jesus, to die for us. And so Jesus then became the substitution for us when we're supposed to die for our sin, Jesus instead died for our sin. As a result, it opens up the opportunity. And notice I use the word opportunity because it's not automatic. It opens up the opportunity for those that are willing to confess their sin and turn from their sin. We call that repentance. They can then receive forgiveness by God and have access instead of the highway to hell, the highway to heaven because of what Jesus did on our behalf. Now, again, when we try to compare ourselves to others, we can always justify the fact that we live a better life. I could probably tell you 15 people right now, and it would take me 60 seconds to name them, of 15 people in my mind that I think I'm better than, and you can too. We all do that. But God says, I don't look at you in comparison to others because the reality is, because of your sin, we're all junk. But God loves junk. He loves junk so much that he gave his only son Jesus to die for that junk because then what's one person's trash is another person's treasure. What the world says is trash, God says, you're my treasure. And so God takes this junk and he makes it into something useful. My life is not good. But God loved me anyway. Your life is not good. But God loved you anyway. So much that he gave his only son Jesus and so God forgave all of that stuff we've done in our life. Even that stuff we don't think is that bad, it required somebody dying for it. Think about just what if the worst thing you did in your life was to take a piece of bubble gum from your six-year-old buddy's pocket? What if that was the only thing you ever did? According to God's word, that that required somebody dying for it. Have you ever thought about that? That even the worst that you, or the best that you think you've got when it comes to the worst things, still required someone to die as a penalty. Boy, that changes our whole perspective when we think about other people. Because then it realizes everything I've done, Jesus had to die for it. Everything that person did, Jesus had to die for it. Which means then it makes the child molester and the little white liar all on the same page in God's eyes. And it all required the same sacrifice. And so when we think about what these different sins represent, or these different debts in this parable, we see the one that owed millions. 
In other words, that was a debt that is impossible to repay. You know, if you owe, if you made or if you owed somebody five million dollars and you went out and bought a lottery ticket right now and you won some kind of a Powerball lottery of five million dollars, do you know that you still couldn't pay your five million dollar debt? You know why? Because they tax that five million dollars. So if you were to do the one-time cash out payment of five million dollars, I think you would get something like um, you'd get something like maybe three and a half million, maybe maybe less. So even if you owed $5 million and you won a Powerball $5 million pot, you couldn't pay back the debt. In other words, God is saying that this parable, this, this parable of that debt is a size of money that's impossible to repay, which means our sin is impossible for us to do anything about. We can't repay what we owe. The smaller deal represents what others have done to us, the smaller debt. It's not big. It's not a big thing at all. We make it big in our minds because we, again, have put categories of what's bad and what's not. Matter of fact, I know some people that will say, well, the Bible says there's one or two sins. I'm not going to talk about those right now, but there's one or two sins that are an abomination before God. So therefore, they're worse. What Bible are you reading? Yeah, he has a couple of them he says is an abomination, but it's interesting enough that it's only in a couple of places and it all still required Jesus to die for. So again... No sin is worse than any other. There may have different effects for different sin, but just because something has a different effect doesn't make it worse. So when someone has done something to me compared to what I've done against God, what they've done against me may be able to harden me to get angry and mad and not want to talk to them, but what I've done against God sends me to hell for all eternity to torment and, and be in anguish. The Bible calls it uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth and total and utter darkness. I mean, that's what I've done. Those things, I didn't think that was that bad. God says deserves all of that. When we look at what others done, it's not even close. Not even close. Yet, oftentimes we can be like that first servant. We want to go grab somebody by the throat, slam against the wall, rip their throat. I mean, we, we get that kind of emotion when we begin thinking about what people have done to us. So how do you reconcile that Jesus seems to be advocating unlimited forgiveness in this parable while the king retracts his forgiveness of the servant who didn't forgive his fellow servant? Well, that's actually pretty easy to explain. See, the word of God teaches us that if we forgive others the sins, if you go back into the Lord's Prayer, and it goes in there about forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those trespasses. Least not temptation. Deliver us from evil. If we go a little bit beyond that, the next verse, it begins going back to the concept of forgiveness. And it talks about the concept of that if we forgive others, and our Heavenly Father will forgive us. But if we don't forgive others, and our Heavenly Father will not forgive us. Do you hear that? If, 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 if we forgive others, then we will receive forgiveness. But if we do not forgive others, we will not be forgiven. Guys, that is serious. Here Jesus is talking about unlimited forgiveness, uh, unlimited forgiveness that we're supposed to give to others. But what he's talking about is a perfect God that says, I am offering unlimited forgiveness. But that forgiveness is also conditional in the fact that we in turn are offering forgiveness to others. In other words, it's a paying it forward effect. God says, I'm going to offer forgiveness, but that forgiveness has to keep getting forward and going forward and going forward and going forward. We're all, we're all familiar with the whole paying it forward concept, right? We go and bless other people's lives. Let me tell you what, there's a lot of people that you probably don't even realize that are longing to hear, I forgive you from you or me. And because we're unwilling to forgive, we think we're okay with God, but God's word says, no, you're not. No, you're not. I'm going to allow you to suffer in anguish. I'm going to allow you to go unforgiven because you're holding that bitterness in your heart. And by the way, bitterness is sin. Sin is separates us from the fellowship with God. Separation from the fellowship of God is anguish. It's agony. It's torment. And no one that's a Christian wants to be in that condition. God says, look, guys, you want to forgive, be forgiven, then you have to forgive. You see, here's the concept that we often, we often overlook when it comes to the forgiveness of our sin. 
God says, if you're faithful to confess your sins, I'm faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. But in that concept is also the concept. It's not just to saying, God, I'm sorry. Because there's been a number of times my kids have told me they're sorry, and they were no more sorry than, than the next person. They were just saying it as lip service. And let's be honest, we often have been guilty of doing lip service to the king. We want to be forgiven, but we don't want to do what's necessary to receive the forgiveness. God says, my forgiveness is offered, but it won't be fulfilled and it won't be realized until you repent of your sins. See, repentance is a term that's often left out in the church by, in the church today. It's not enough to confess your sin. The Bible says to be sa saved, you have to confess and repent, which means we have to turn from our sin. We've gone in one direction. The term is literally we're turning in a 180 degree direction, going in one direction, going in the opposite. We have to turn from that sin. So when we are holding on to bitterness and unforgiveness in our heart, what we're saying is, God, I want you to forgive me, but I don't want to let go of my sin. And God says, you know what? That's not good enough. I won't forgive you then. You want my forgiveness? You've got to let go of what you're holding on to. Because see, here's the deal. When we're holding on to it, what we're really saying is, I want control of my life. And God says, you can't follow me and have control of your life. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You are either a servant of mine or you're not a servant of mine. But you can't have both. And too many times, let's be honest, we are trying to do both. And God says, I'm not having nothing of it. I won't have it. You can be forgiven. And it's unlimited. But, you got to be willing to walk away. Now, that's hard because we see that from God, and yet Jesus is telling us to forgive unlimited to other people. But folks, let me tell you something. I am not the judge of other people. I can't send people to heaven or hell. I can't tell people where they're going to go. All I can do is tell people about Jesus. God is the judge. And if this is how God chooses to do that, I don't have the right to try to pretend to be God. I don't have the right to try to understand the mind of God. My, my Bible teaches me that my ways are separate from his ways. As far as, as far as the heavens are above the earth are my ways and his ways, my thoughts and his thoughts. I don't pretend to understand the mind of God. God says, this is what's required for you to receive forgiveness. And that forgiveness is conditioned upon our willingness to forgive others. Isn't that interesting? But God is saying that's what it takes. Because what I'm saying is, I have the right to hold on to control of what I do. But you don't have the right to hold on to me and hold on to yourself. You have to choose. So what does it mean to forgive one another from the heart? From the heart. In other words, it has to be authentic. You and I have both been guilty of telling people, you're forgiven, but we didn't mean it. We walked away still as angry as a hornet as we were before we ever had the conversation because we chose to hold on to what happened to us. If we want to be forgiven, we have to then forgive from the heart. It has to be authentic. It has to be real. It has to be genuine. You know, we get on our kids where our kids, I'm sorry. No, they're not. You and I both know them kids ain't sorry. They sorry for the way they talking because they just sorry individuals in that moment, right? No. They come up and they say, I'm sorry, because they want us to stop being angry. They want us, they'll, want us, they'll say whatever they can say to make us uh, to make us stop being angry at them or to, to, make us, to make us feel better toward them. And quite frankly, we try to do the same bargaining with God. And I'm going to come up and I'm going to say, I'm sorry. And God says, look, I love you. Just like we would tell our kids, I love you. But until you recognize what you're doing and you're willing to turn from that bitterness inside, I can't forgive. You've got to forgive and then I will forgive. My forgiveness is conditioned and attached to the forgiveness that you have to offer. Now, I realize we're talking about some hard stuff, y'all. It's one of those things that preachers aren't talking about anymore. We don't want to talk about the concept of repentance anymore. We want to talk about being saved and going to heaven and dancing in through the posies and da-da-da-da-da. And y'all, the Bible teaches hard stuff, and this is one of those hard sayings that God is saying, forgive and you will be forgiven. Don't forgive and you won't be forgiven. That's hard because that's that, that seems so contrary to what many of us have heard God say from his word. No, it's not what he said from his word. God says this from his word. It's what people are preaching that's wrong. And we need to understand 
These things do have conditions. What has been given to us through Jesus Christ is a free gift, but it does have things attached. We can't receive salvation from Jesus and live the life we want to live. So love absolutely is tied to forgiveness. So how does God demonstrate, or how does Jesus demonstrate throughout this passage the seriousness of which he takes forgiving one another? He says, he tells us at the end, that everything our Heavenly Father wants to do for us is conditioned on what we do for one another. Isn't that interesting? Check this out. The two greatest commandments, Jesus said, the greatest above all, there is no other commandments that even come close, it says. Not one single command, nothing in Scripture. There's two commands that are the single most important things that Jesus ever said to us. He said it this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And, he said, the other is equally or likened to it, which means it is equally important. The first one is not more important than the second. They are tied together. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. Wow, y'all. Think about that. God is tying these two things together. We've talked about this before. This is the vertical relationship we have with God. This is the horizontal, and it both forms what? The cross. This is the horizontal relationship we have with each other. This is the vertical relationship we have with God. And so God's word is telling us, and here it is, it's reiterating that God's forgiveness and our forgiveness to others parallel, or not parallel, but they're, they're perfectly, they cross one another. They, 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 they are absolutely essential. They are equally important. God's forgiveness to us is conditional on our forgiveness to others. Our love for God is demonstrated in our love for others. We're told that in the greatest commandments. We're told that again here. And so I'm going to challenge you with this, folks. How do you and I need to grow in loving others by forgiving them? Who is one individual in your life that you can think of right now that you may need to pick up a phone? You may need to send a text message. You may need to send a, an email. You may need to call them. You may need to send them a Facebook message. You may need to write them a handwritten letter. <laughs> I realize a lot of us have forgotten how to do that. A handwritten letter. Lick a stamp. Stack it on there, right? Slap it on the envelope and send it off. We might need to show up at their door, obviously, when things are right, or stand in their driveway and talk to them from the car. Who's one individual that we need to seek to offer forgiveness? Who is it? Here's the deal. One of the greatest ways that we can show love is to forgive. Does that mean that the individual we forgive deserves it? No. That's the whole issue of forgiveness. No, they don't deserve it. They deserve to rot in their punishment. That's the reality. They deserve that. But you know what? We deserve a life. They deserve an eternity in hell. And God sent his only son when it wasn't. we weren't worth it. We deserve the punishment. But God showed us mercy. He showed us love. So we don't forgive because somebody deserves it. We give because it's what's been given to us. And our forgiveness is conditional on what we offer. It's tough stuff, y'all. But here's the things about the scriptures. God tells us all kinds of things that are hard to handle. But he also doesn't require us to do it alone. He gives us a helper in the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, we have the ability, we're equipped to accomplish all that God commands us to do. It's not easy. If it was easy, then everybody would be doing it. It's not supposed to be easy because if it were easy, then we would have no need for God. And God says, you know what? I'm never going to leave you nor forsake you. And you know what? Jesus goes into heaven. He says, I'm going to send a helper. You know what that helper was designed to do? To help us carry out all that God commands us. Because everything God commands us is impossible to do in and of our own strength. We can't do it. That's why we need God. If we could do it on our own, we would have no need for God. But this is a command of God to do. So therefore, it requires God in us to accomplish it. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for me? Today is a day of surrender. Today is a day to recognize, God, I have people in my life, or I have one person in my life that I have just been unable to forgive. And God says, that's okay. Give the situation to me. I'll open up the opportunity and I'll change your heart toward that individual. And you know what? God does each and every time. And so today is just a day of surrender. God wants you to show love. And in this case, showing love by forgiving. 
Who is it? Are you going to let God work in your heart and life to, to do something through you, to do something amazing, to do something what honestly we would call supernatural? I hope so. I hope that you're able to show love through forgiveness. Can I pray for you? Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you and love you for being an amazing God. And there is no one like you. I pray today that you would help each one of us identify areas in our life that we need to offer forgiveness. In some cases, it's an individual. Some cases, it's a family member. Some cases, it's a friend. Some cases, it's a neighbor. Sometimes, it's somebody that's not even alive anymore. But we're still holding on this bitterness and hatred toward it. And Father, you want us to experience freedom. And we know that we can't be free as long as we are harboring or resentment and unforgiveness in our life. Father, we want to have victory. So God, help us to offer forgiveness right here, right now, even if it means just doing it in the comfort of our home so that we can call upon the name of the Lord and ask him to take this thought from us, to take this feeling from us, to remove the agony of unforgiveness from our lives so that we can experience the love that Jesus has shown us and we can then give it to others. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth. We thank you that you don't give us the fluff stuff. We thank you that you don't sugarcoat anything. We thank you that you give us hard passages that we sometimes scratch our head and don't fully understand. But God, because of your Holy Spirit, we can grapple with it. We can grasp it, and then we can do it. Your word says, if you love me, you will obey my command. So God, help us to love you tonight. And we give you all the praise, honor, and glory for who you are. We thank you for your son, Jesus who you allow to die on the cross for our sins, be raised from the dead, and give us victory over death and eternal life for all those who trust and believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you all for joining us. We pray that you will take a moment and press share so that others can join in with this teaching. And we look forward to seeing you all next week. God bless you.